This sound file contains the spoken version of the Wikipedia article on Carl Donitz. The material was recorded on December 16th, 2017. Carl Donitz from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. Carl Donitz was a German admiral who played a major role in the naval history of World War II. Donitz briefly succeeded Adolf Hitler as the head of state of Germany. He began his career in the Imperial German Navy before World War I. In 1918, while he was in charge of UB-68, the submarine was sunk by British forces and Donitz was taken prisoner. While in a prisoner of war camp, he formulated what he later called Rudel Taktik, or Pack Tactic, commonly called Wolf Pack. At the start of World War II, he was the senior submarine officer in the Kriegsmarine. In January 1943, Donitz achieved the rank of Gross Admiral, or Grand Admiral, and replaced Grand Admiral Eric Rader as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. On April 30, 1945, after the death of Adolf Hitler, and in accordance with Hitler's last will and testament, Donitz was named Hitler's successor as Head of State, with the title of President of Germany and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. On May 7, 1945, he ordered Alfred Jodl, Chief of Operations Staff of the OKW, to sign the German Instruments of Surrender in Reims, France. Donitz remained as head of the Flensburg government, as it became known, until it was dissolved by the Allied powers on May 23rd. At the Nuremberg trials, he was convicted of war crimes and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. After his release, he lived quietly in a village near Hamburg until his death in 1980. Section 1. Early Life and Career Donitz was born in Grunau, near Berlin, Germany, to Anner Beyer and Emil Donitz, an engineer, in 1891. Karl had an older brother. In 1910, Donitz enlisted in the Kaiserlich Marine, or the Imperial Navy. On September 27, 1913, Donitz was commissioned as a Lieutenant zur See, or Acting Sub-Lieutenant. When World War I began, he served on the light cruiser SMS Breslau in the Mediterranean Sea. In August 1914, the Breslau and the battlecruiser SMS Gobin were sold to the Ottoman Navy. The ships were renamed the Middle and the Yavoz Sultan Selim, respectively. They began operating out of Constantinople under Rear Admiral Wilhelm Sokon, engaging Russian forces in the Black Sea. On March 22, 1916, Donitz was promoted to Oberleutnant Zur See. When the Middle East put into dock for repairs, he was temporarily assigned as airfield commander at the Dardanelles. From there, he requested a transfer to the submarine forces, which became effective in October 1916. He served as watch officer on U-39, and from February 1917 onward as commander of UC-25. On September 5, 1917, he became commander of UB-68, operating in the Mediterranean. On October 4, after suffering technical difficulties, this boat was sunk by British forces and Donitz was taken prisoner on the island of Malta. Section 2. Interwar Period The war ended in 1918, but Donitz remained in a British camp near Sheffield as a prisoner of war until his release in July 1919. He returned to Germany in 1920. During the interwar period, he continued his naval career in the naval arm of the Weimar's Republic's armed forces. On January 10, 1921, he became a Kapitan Leutnant, or Lieutenant, in the new German Navy. Donitz commanded torpedo boats, becoming a Corvetten Kapitan, or Lieutenant Commander, on November 1, 1928. On September 1, 1933, he became a Fregatten Kapitan, or Commander, and in 1934 was put in command of the cruiser Emden, the ship on which cadets and midshipmen took a year-long world cruise in preparation for a future officer's commission. On September 1, 1935, he was promoted to Capitan Zur See, or Naval Captain. He was placed in command of the first U-boat flotilla Weddigen, which included U-7, U-8, and U-9. During 1935, the Weimar Republic's Navy, the Reichsmarine, was replaced by the Nazi German Navy, the Kriegsmarine. Throughout 1935 and 1936, Donitz had misgivings regarding submarines due to German overestimation of the capabilities of British ASDIC intelligence. In reality, ASDIC could detect only one submarine in ten during exercises. In the words of Alan Hotham, British Director of Naval Intelligence, 
ASDIC was a, quote, huge bluff, unquote. German doctrine at the time, based on the work of American Admiral Alfred Mahan and shared by all major navies, called for submarines to be integrated with surface fleets and employed against enemy warships. By November 1937, Donitz became convinced that a major campaign against merchant shipping was practical and began pressing for the conversion of the German fleet almost entirely to U-boats. He advocated a strategy of attacking only merchant ships, targets relatively safe to attack. He pointed out that destroying Britain's fleet of oil tankers would starve the Royal Navy of supplies needed to run its ships, which could be just as effective as sinking them. He thought a German fleet of 300 of the newer Type 7 U-boats could knock Britain out of the war. Donuts revived the World War I idea of grouping several submarines together into a, quote, wolf pack, unquote, to overwhelm a merchant convoy's defensive escorts. Implementation of wolf packs had been difficult in World War I, owing to the limitations of available radios. In the interwar years, Germany had developed ultra-high-frequency transmitters, which it hoped would make their radio communications unjammable, while the Enigma cipher machine was believed to have made communications secure. Donitz also adopted and claimed credit for Wilhelm Marshall's 1922 idea of attacking convoys using surface or very near the surface night attacks. This tactic had the added advantage of making a submarine undetectable by sonar. At the time, many, including Admiral Eric Rader, felt such talk marked Donitz as a weakling. Donitz was alone among senior naval officers, including some former submariners, in believing in a new submarine war on trade. Donitz and Radar argued constantly over funding priorities within the Navy, while at the same time competing with Hitler's friends, such as Hermann Göring, who received greater attention at this time. Since the surface strength of the Kriegsmarine was much less than that of the British Royal Navy, Radar believed any war with Britain in the near future would doom it to uselessness, once remarking all the Germans could hope to do was to die valiantly. Radar based his hopes on wars being delayed until the Kriegsmarine extensive, quote, Z-plan, unquote, which would have expanded Germany's surface fleet to where it could effectively contend with the Royal Navy, was implemented. The, quote, Z-plan, unquote, however, was not scheduled to be completed until 1945. Donitz, in contrast, was not constrained by such fatalism, but set about intensely training his crews in the new tactics. The marked inferiority of the German surface fleet left submarine warfare as Germany's primary naval option once war broke out. On January 28, 1939, Donitz was promoted to Commodore and Commander of Submarines. Section 3, World War II. In September 1939, Germany invaded Poland. Britain and France declared war on Germany, and World War II began. The Kriegsmarine was caught unprepared for war, having expected that war would break out in 1945 instead of 1939. The Z-Plan was tailored for this assumption, calling for a balanced fleet with a greatly increased number of surface capital ships, including several aircraft carriers. At the time the war began, Donitz's force included only 57 U-boats, many of them short-range, and only 22 ocean-going Type 7s. He made do with what he had while being harassed by radar and with Hitler calling on him to dedicate boats to military actions against the British fleet directly. These operations had mixed success, the aircraft carrier HMS Courageous and battleship Royal Oak were sunk. Battleships HMS Nelson damaged and Barham sunk at a cost of some U-boats, diminishing the small quantity available even further. Together with surface raiders, merchant shipping lines were also attacked by U-boats. Commander of the Submarine Fleet On October 1, 1939, Donitz became a Contre-Admiral or Rear Admiral and, quote, Commander of the Submarines, unquote. On September 1st of the following year, he was made a Vice Admiral or Vice Admiral. With the fall of France, Germany acquired U-boat bases at Lorient, Brest, Saint Nazaire, and La Palice and La Rochelle. A communication center was established at the Chateau de Pignerol and at Saint Barthélemy de Anjou. By 1941, the delivery of new Type Sevens had improved to the point where operations were having a real effect on the British wartime economy. Although production of merchant ships shot up in response, improved torpedoes, better U-boats, and much better operational planning led to increasing number of, quote, kills, unquote. On December 11, 1941, following Hitler's declaration of war on the United States, Donitz immediately planned for implementation of Operation Drumbeat. 
This targeted shipping along the east coast of the United States carried out the next month with only nine U-boats. It had dramatic and far-reaching results. The U.S. Navy was entirely unprepared for anti-submarine warfare, despite having had two years of British experience to draw from, and committed every imaginable mistake. Shipping losses which had appeared to be coming under control as the Royal Navy and Royal Canadian Navy gradually adapted to the new challenge, skyrocketed. On at least two occasions, Allied success against U-boat operations led donuts to investigate. Among reasons considered were espionage and Allied interception and decoding of German naval communications, the naval version of the Enigma cipher machine. Both investigations into communication security came to the conclusion espionage was more likely, or else the Allied successes had been accidental. Nevertheless, Donitz ordered his U-boat fleet to use an improved version of the Enigma machine, one with four rotors, which was much more secure than the three-rotor version it replaced. The M4 for communications within the fleet, on February 1st, 1942. The Kriegsmarine was the only branch to use this improved version. The rest of the Wehrmacht continued to use their then-current three-rotor versions of the Enigma machine. The new system was termed, quote, Triton, unquote, or Shark to the Allies. For a time, this change in encryption between submarines caused considerable difficulty for Allied codebreakers. It took 10 months before Shark traffic could be read. By the end of 1942, the production of Type 7 U-boats had increased to the point where Donitz was finally able to conduct mass attacks by groups of submarines, a tactic he called Rudel, and became known as, quote, Wolfpack, unquote, in English. Allied shipping losses shot up tremendously, and serious concern existed for a while about the state of British fuel supplies. During 1943, the war in the Atlantic turned against the Germans, but Donitz continued to push for increased U-boat construction and entertained the notion that further technological developments would tip the war once more in Germany's favor, briefing the fewer to that effect. At the end of the war, the German submarine fleet was by far the most advanced in the world and late war examples, such as the Type XXI U-boat, served as models for Soviet and American construction after the war. The Schnorkel, or Snorkel, and Type XXI boats appeared late in the war because of Donitz's personal indifference, at times even hostility, to new technology he perceived as disruptive to the production process. His opposition to the larger Type IX was not unique. Admiral Thomas C. Hart, commander of the United States Asiatic Fleet in the Philippines at the outbreak of the Pacific War, opposed fleet boats like the Gato and Balao classes as, quote, too luxurious, unquote. Donitz was deeply involved in the daily operations of his boats, often contracting them up to 70 times a day with questions such as their position, fuel supply, and other minutiae. This incessant questioning hastened the compromise of his ciphers, by giving the Allies more messages to work with. Furthermore, replies from the boats enabled the Allies to use direction finding to locate a U-boat using its radio, track it and attack it, often with aircraft able to sink it with impunity. Donitz wore on his uniform the special grade of the U-boat war badge with diamonds, his U-boat war badge from World War I, and his World War I Iron Cross first class with World War II clasp. Commander-in-Chief and Grand Admiral on January 30, 1943, Donitz replaced Eric Rader as Commander-in-Chief of the Navy and Gross Admiral, Grand Admiral, of the Naval High Command. His deputy, Eberhard Gott, took over the operational command of the U-boat force. Donitz was able to convince Hitler not to scrap the remaining ships of the surface fleet. Despite hoping to continue to use them as a fleet in being, the Kriegsmarine continued to lose what few capital ships it had. In September, the battleship Tirpitz was put out of action for months by a British midget submarine and was sunk a year later by RAF bombers at anchor in Norway. In December, he ordered the battleship Scharnhorst under Contra Admiral Eric Bay to attack Soviet-bound convoys after reconsidering her success in the early years of the war with sister ship Genisenau, but she was sunk in the resulting encounter with superior British forces led by the battleship HMS Duke of York. President of Germany In the final days of the war, after Hitler had taken refuge in the Fuhrer bunker beneath the Reich Chancellery Garden in Berlin, Reichsmarshal Hermann Göring was considered the obvious successor to Hitler, followed by Reichsfuhrer SS Heinrich Himmler. Göring, however, infuriated Hitler by radioing him in Berlin, asking for permission to assume leadership of the Reich. 
Himmler also tried to seize power by entering into negotiations with Count Bernadotte. On April 28, 1945, the BBC reported Hitler had offered surrender to the Western Allies and that the offer had been declined. From mid-April 1945, elements of the last Reich government and the commander of the Navy, Admiral Karl Donitz, moved into the buildings of the Stadtheit Barracks in Plun. In his last will and testament, dated April 29, 1945, Hitler named Donitz as his successor as Stadt Soberhaupt, or head of state, with the titles of Reich's President or President and Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces. The same document named Propaganda Minister Joseph Goebbels as head of government with the title Reichskanzler or Chancellor. Furthermore, Hitler expelled both Goring and Himmler from the party. Rather than designate one person to succeed him as Fuhrer, Hitler reverted to the old arrangement in the Weimar Constitution. He believed the leaders of the Air Force and SS had betrayed him. Since the Kriegsmarine had been too small to affect the war in a major way, its commander, Donitz, became the only possible successor as far as Hitler was concerned, more or less by default. On May 1st, the day after Hitler's own suicide, Goebbels committed suicide. Donitz thus became the sole representative of the crumbling German Reich. He appointed Finance Minister Count Ludwig Schirin von Krosik as, quote, leading minister, unquote, and they attempted to form a government. On May 1st, Donitz announced that Hitler had fallen and had appointed him as successor. On May 2nd, the new government of the Reich fled to flensburg moorwick before the approaching British troops. That night, Donitz made a nationwide radio address in which he announced Hitler's death and said the war would continue in the East, quote, to save Germany from destruction by the advancing Bolshevik enemy, unquote. However, Donitz knew Germany's position was untenable and the Wehrmacht was no longer capable of offering meaningful resistance. During his brief period in office, he devoted most of his effort to ensuring the loyalty of the German armed forces and trying to ensure German troops would surrender to the British or Americans and not the Soviets. He feared vengeful Soviet reprisals and hoped to strike a deal with the Western Allies. In the end, Donitz's tactics were moderately successful, enabling about 1.8 million German soldiers to escape Soviet capture. Flensburg Government Donitz's headquarters were located in the Naval Academy in Moorwick, a suburb of Flensburg near the Danish border. Accordingly, his administration was referred to as the Flensburg government. The following is Donitz's description of his new government. Quote, These considerations, which all pointed to the need for the creation of some sort of central government, took shape and form when I was joined by Graf Schurin Krosik. In addition to discharging his duties as foreign minister and minister of finance, he formed the temporary government we needed and presided over the activities of its cabinet. Though restricted in his choice to men in northern Germany, he nonetheless succeeded in forming a workmanlike cabinet of experts. The picture of the military situation as a whole showed clearly that the war was lost. As there was also no possibility of effecting any improvement in Germany's overall position by political means, the only conclusion to which I, as head of state, could come was that the war must be brought to an end as quickly as possible in order to prevent further bloodshed." Unquote. Karl Donitz, 10 years and 20 days. Late on May 1st, Himmler attempted to make a place for himself in the Flensburg government. The following is the description of Donitz's showdown with Himmler. Quote, At about midnight he arrived, accompanied by six armed SS officers, and was received by my aide-de-camp, Walter Lloyd Norath. I offered Himmler a chair and sat down at my desk on which lay, hidden by some papers, a pistol with a safety catch off. I had never done anything of this sort in my life before, but I did not know what the outcome of this meeting might be. I handed Himmler the telegram containing my appointment. Please read this, I said. I watched him closely. As he read, an expression of astonishment, indeed of consternation, spread over his face. All hope seemed to collapse within him. He went very pale. Finally, he stood up and bowed. Allow me, he said, to become the second man in your state. I replied that was out of the question and that there was no way I could make any use of his services. Thus advised, he left me at about one o'clock in the morning. The showdown had taken place without force and I felt relieved. Unquote. Karl Donitz as quoted in The Decline and Fall of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. On May 4th, Admiral Hans George Friedberg representing Admiral Donitz, surrendered all German forces in the Netherlands, Denmark, and northwestern Germany 
under Donitz's command to Field Marshal Sir Bernard Law Montgomery at Lundberg Heath, just southeast of Hamburg, signaling the end of World War II in northwestern Europe. A day later, Donitz sent Friedberg to U.S. General Dwight D. Eisenhower's headquarters in Reims, France, to negotiate a surrender to the Allies. The chief of staff of OKW, General Oberst Alfred Yodel, arrived a day later. Donitz had instructed them to draw out the negotiations for as long as possible so that German troops and refugees could surrender to the Western powers. But when Eisenhower let it known he would not tolerate their stalling, Donitz authorized Yodel to sign the instrument of unconditional surrender at 1.30 in the morning on May 7th. Just over an hour later, Yodel signed the documents. The surrender documents included the phrase, quote, All forces under German control to seize active operations at 2301 hours Central European time on May 8, 1945, unquote. At Stalin's insistence on May 8, shortly before midnight, Wilhelm Kittel repeated the signing in Berlin at Marshal Georgi Zhukov's headquarters with General Karl Spatz of the U.S. Army Air Forces present as Eisenhower's representative. At the time specified, World War II in Europe ended. On May 23rd, the Donitz government was dissolved when Gross Admiral Donitz was arrested by an RAF regiment task force under the command of squadron leader Mark Hobden. The Gross Admiral's Kriegsman Marine flag, which was removed from his headquarters, can be seen at the RAF Regiment Heritage Center at RAF Honington. General Oberst Jodl, Reich's Minister Speer, and other members were also handed over to the troops of the King's Shropshire Light Infantry at Flensburg. His ceremonial baton, awarded to him by Hitler, can be seen in the Regimental Museum of the KSLI in Shrewsbury Castle. Section 4. Donitz's Relationship to Jews and Nazism Despite his post-war claims, Donitz was seen as supportive of Nazism during the war. Several naval officers have described him as, quote, closely tied to Hitler and Nazi ideology, unquote. On one occasion, he spoke of Hitler's humanity. Another event in which he spoke to Hitler Youth in what was defined as an, quote, inappropriate way, unquote, earned him the nickname of, quote, Hitler Youth Donuts, unquote. He refused to help Albert Speer stop the scorched earth policy dictated by Hitler, and is also noted to have declared, quote, in comparison to Hitler, we are all pipsqueaks. Anyone who believes he could do better than the fewer is stupid, unquote. Several anti-Semitic statements by Donuts are known. When Sweden closed its international waters to Germany, he blamed this action on their fear and dependence on, quote, international Jewish capital, unquote. In August 1944, he declared, quote, I would rather eat dirt than see my grandchildren grow up in the filthy, poisonous atmosphere of Jewry, unquote. On German Heroes Day, March 12th of 1944, Donitz declared that without Adolf Hitler, Germany would be beset by, quote, the poison of Jewry, unquote, and the country destroyed for lack of national socialism, which, as Donitz declared, meant an uncompromising ideology with defiance. At the Nuremberg trials, Donitz claimed the statement about the, quote, poison of Jewry, unquote, was regarding, quote, the endurance, the power to endure of the people as it was composed could be better preserved than if there were Jewish elements in the nation, unquote. Initially, he claimed, quote, I could imagine that it would be very difficult for the population in the towns to hold out under the strain of heavy bombing attacks if such an influence were allowed to work." Unquote. Author Eric Zilmer argues that, from an ideological standpoint, Donitz was anti-Marxist and anti-Semitic. Later, during the Nuremberg trials, Donitz claimed to know nothing about the extermination of Jews and declared that nobody among, quote, his men, unquote, thought about violence against Jews. Donitz told Leon Goldenson, an American psychiatrist at Nuremberg, quote, I never had any idea of the going-ons as far as Jews were concerned. Hitler said each man should take care of his business, and mine was U-boats and the Navy, unquote. Donitz also told Dr. Goldenson of his support for Admiral Bernhard Rogue, who had one Jewish grandparent, when the Nazis began to persecute him. Section 5. Nuremberg War Crimes Trials Following the war, Donitz was held as a prisoner of war by the Allies. He was indicted as a major war criminal at the Nuremberg Trials on three counts. Conspiracy to commit crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Planning, initiating, and waging wars of aggression, and crimes against the laws of war. 
Donitz was found not guilty on count one of the indictment, but guilty on counts two and three. Donitz was for nearly seven decades the only head of state to be convicted by an international tribunal until the conviction of Liberia's Charles Taylor in 2012. During the trial, Gustav Gilbert, an American army psychologist, was allowed to examine the Nazi leaders who were tried at Nuremberg for war crimes. Among other tests, a German version of the Wexler Bellevue IQ test was administered. Donitz and Hermann Göring scored 138, which made them equally the third highest among the Nazi leaders tested. Donitz disputed the propriety of his trial at Nuremberg, commenting on count two, quote, One of the accusations that made me guilty during this trial was that I met and planned the course of the war with Hitler. Now I ask them in heaven's name, how could an admiral do otherwise with his country's head of state in a time of war? Unquote. Over 100 senior Allied officers also sent letters to Donitz, conveying their disappointment over the fairness and verdict of his trial. At the trial, Donitz was charged with waging unrestricted submarine warfare against neutral shipping, permitting Hitler's commando order of October 18, 1942 to remain in full force when he became commander-in-chief of the Navy, and to that extent responsibility for that crime, knowing that 12,000 involuntary foreign workers were working in the shipyards and doing nothing to stop it, advice in 1945 when Hitler asked Donitz whether the Geneva Convention should be denounced, Hitler's motives were twofold. The first was that reprisals could be taken against Western Allied prisoners of war. Second, it would deter German forces from surrendering to the Western Allies. Instead of arguing the conventions should never be denounced, Donitz suggested it was not expedient to do so, so the court found against him on this issue. But as the convention was not denounced by Germany, and British prisoners in camps under Donitz's jurisdiction were treated strictly according to the convention, the court considered these mitigating circumstances. Among the war crimes charges, Donitz was accused of waging unrestricted submarine warfare for issuing War Order No. 154 in 1939 and another similar order after the Laconia incident in 1942, not to rescue survivors from ships attacked by submarine. By issuing these two orders, he was found guilty of causing Germany to be in breach of the Second London Naval Treaty of 1936. However, as evidence of similar conduct by the Allies was presented at his trial, and with the help of his lawyer Otto Kronzbuhler, his sentence was not assessed on the grounds of his breach of international law. On the specific war crimes charge of ordering unrestricted submarine warfare, Donitz was found, quote, not guilty for his conduct of submarine warfare against the British armed merchant ships, unquote, because they were often armed and equipped with radios which they used to notify the Admiralty of attack. But the judges found, quote, Donitz is charged with waging unrestricted submarine warfare contrary to the naval protocol of 1936 to which Germany acceded and which reaffirmed the rules of submarine warfare laid down in the London Naval Agreement of 1930. The order of Donitz to sink neutral ships without warning when found within these zones was therefore in the opinion of the tribunal, violation of the protocol. The orders then prove Donitz is guilty of a violation of the protocol the sentence of Donitz is not assessed on the ground of his breaches of the international law of submarine warfare." Unquote. His sentence on unrestricted submarine warfare was not assessed because of similar actions by the Allies. In particular, the British Admiralty on May 8, 1940, had ordered all vessels in the Skagerrak sunk on sight, and Admiral Chester Nimitz, wartime commander-in-chief of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, stated the U.S. Navy had waged unrestricted submarine warfare in the Pacific from the day the U.S. entered the war. Thus, although Donitz was found guilty of waging unrestricted submarine warfare against unarmed neutral shipping by ordering all ships in designated areas in international waters to be sunk without warning, no additional prison time was added to his sentence for this crime. Donitz was imprisoned for 10 years in Spandau Prison in what was then West Berlin. Section 6, Later Years Donitz was released on October 1, 1956, and retired to the small village of Almul in Schleswig-Holstein in northern West Germany. There, he worked on two books, his memoirs Zenjar, Zanzwig Te, Memoirs 10 Years and 20 Days, appeared in Germany in 1958 and became available in an English translation the following year. This book recounted Donitz's experience as U-boat commander and president of Germany. In it, Donitz explains the Nazi regime as a product of its time, but argues that he was not a politician 
and thus not morally responsible for much of the regime's crimes. He likewise criticizes dictatorship as a fundamentally flawed form of government and blames it for much of the Nazi era's failing. In 1973, he appeared in the Thames television production The World at War in one of his few television appearances. Donitz's second book, My Ever-Changing Life, is less known, perhaps because it deals with the events of his life before 1934. This book was first published in 1968, and a new edition was released in 1998 with the revised title My Martial Life. Later in his life, Donitz made every attempt to answer correspondence and autograph postcards for others. Donitz was unrepentant regarding his role in World War II, as he firmly believed that he had acted at all times out of duty to his nation. He also maintained the belief that to betray military secrets, even when working with the enemy, is a despicable act of treachery. He was firmly convinced that nobody should or would respect an individual who did not share such a conviction. The West German government argued that he should receive only the pension pay of a captain because all of his advances in rank after that had been because of Hitler, but he won a court case demanding the pension for his final rank. Donitz lived out the rest of his life in relative obscurity and Aumul, occasionally corresponding with collectors of German naval history, and died there of a heart attack on December 24, 1980. As the last German officer with the rank of Gross Admiral, or Grand Admiral, he was honored by many former servicemen and former naval officers who came to pay their respects at his funeral on January 6, 1981. He was buried in Waldfriedhof Cemetery in Aumul without military honors and soldiers were not allowed to wear uniforms to the funeral. However, a number of German naval officers disobeyed this order and were joined by members of the Royal Navy, such as the senior chaplain, the Reverend Dr. John Cameron, in full dress uniform. Also in attendance were over 100 holders of the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Wife and Children On May 27, 1916, Donitz married a nurse named Ingborg Weber, the daughter of a German general, Erich Paul Weber. They had three children, whom they raised as Protestant Christians, daughter Ursula, and sons Klaus and Peter. In 1937, Karl Donitz's daughter Ursula married U-boat commander Gunther Hessler. Both of Donitz's sons were killed during the Second World War. The younger, Peter, was killed on May 19, 1943, when U-954 was sunk in the North Atlantic with all hands. After the loss, the elder son Klaus was allowed to leave combat duty and began studying to be a naval doctor. Klaus was killed on May 13, 1944, while taking part in an action contrary to standing orders, prohibiting his involvement in any combat role. He persuaded his friends to let him go on the torpedo boat S-141 for a raid on Celsi on his 24th birthday. The boat was sunk by the French destroyer La Combat Tante and Klaus died, though six others were rescued. Section 7. In Popular Culture Karl Donitz has been portrayed in film, television, theater productions, and other media. David Mitchell in the 2006 British TV sketch comedy That Mitchell and Webb Look, Gert Hunch in the 1976 Czechoslovak film Osvo Bozeni Prey, Peter Roering in the 2005 German TV series Spear und Air, Philip Rahm in the 2013 US TV PBS production Nazi Mega Weapons Episode 2, Raymond Cloutier in the 2000 Canadian US TV production Nuremberg, Richard Bebb in the 1973 British television production The Death of Adolf Hitler, Simeon Viktorov in the 2006 British television docudrama Nuremberg Nazis on Trial, Thomas Kretschmann in the 2011 Anglo-German TV production The Sinking of the Laconia. He is additionally a figure in Neil Stevenson's Cryptonomicon. Section 8. Summary of Career Promotions Kaiserlich Marine April 1st, 1910, Officer Cadet April 15, 1911, Midshipman September 27, 1913, Acting Sub-Lieutenant March 22, 1916, Sub-Lieutenant The Reichsmarine January 10, 1921, Lieutenant November 1, 1928, Corvette Captain, Lieutenant Commander October 1, 1933, Frigate Captain, Commander the Kriegsmarine. October 1st, 1935, Captain at Sea, Captain. 
January 28, 1939, Commodore. October 1, 1939, Rear Admiral. September 1, 1940, Vice Admiral. March 14, 1942, Admiral. January 30, 1943, Grand Admiral. Section 9, Decorations and Awards. Okay, here we go. 223rd Oak Leaves on April 6, 1943. As Gross Admiral and Ober Bethel Sheber der Kriegsmarine and Bethel Sheber der U-Boot. Clasp to the Iron Cross, 1939, Second Class, and First Class. Friedrich Cross, First Class. General Honor Decoration. Honor Cross of the World War, 1914 to 1918. Iron Cross, Second Class and First Class. Knight of the Royal House Order of Hohenzollern with swords. Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves. Knight's Cross on April 21st, 1940 as Counter Admiral and Bethel Schaber der U-Boat. Order of Michael the Brave, 1st Class, Romania. Order of Michael the Brave, 2nd and 3rd Class, Romania. Order of Naval Merit in white, Spain. Order of the Medjidi, 4th Class. Order of the Rising Sun, 1st Class, Japan. Ottoman War Medal. Special U-Boat War Badge with swastika and laurel branches with diamonds. Sudetenland Medal. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 Unported License, available at http colon forward slash forward slash creativecommons.org forward slash licenses forward slash by dash sa forward slash 3.0